thanks for being here today. <laughs> On the ride over, my wife and I, you know, all through the week we hear of people who are going away for the weekend and, and then uh, last minute, you know, oh, we had this come up, that come up. So we actually thought we were going to be here alone today. And uh, it's good that I don't have to talk to myself, but uh, I wish I was wishing you a happy Memorial Day weekend. It's hard to believe we're at Labor Day, but as we just sang, the Lord is faithful and he's good to us no matter what season we're in. And it's always good. This is my favorite day. It's always good to come together as his family to worship him together. A couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife mentioned new lighting that's going up, and we especially wanted to thank Don and Tim here and uh, others who have had a part in putting those new lights up. Tim, I know you weren't here that Sunday, uh, but we want to thank you all who have been involved in that project, helping us along the way. Dave, thanks for getting that for us. Uh, God is so good. He just always provides the right materials, the right people at the right time. And so uh, things are a little bit brighter around here, and we're excited about that. But uh, I wanted to make sure that I thanked those who have been involved also. So if you still have your Bibles, get there to Acts chapter 8. We have been kind of walking through this letter written by Dr. Luke. He also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we've been traveling together for about 12 weeks now uh, through the book of Acts. And, you know, really Acts is all about the history of earliest Christianity. And by looking at it each week, we're, we're getting uh, an idea not only of the character of the original earliest Christianity, but we're also starting to get a glimpse at where they got their power for living the kind of lives that they lived. It's been very challenging to me. I hope that it's been challenging to you. And, you know, the book of Acts actually can kind of be outlined along uh, the same lines that Jesus actually gave himself. You'll remember before he ascended back to heaven, he said to his apostles in Matthew 28, he said, I want you to take the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for you, what he's done for us. I want you to take that gospel first to Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And we asked the question last week, how in the world did God take Jewish Jerusalem and the Jews that were there, how did that gospel that was at that point mainly directed at them, how did he get it beyond those walls and then out into Samaria and Judea and even to us today, those in the uttermost world? How did that happen? We recognized last week that it happened through persecution. Persecution came to the church. And so for those first seven chapters, which we've already looked at, uh, we, we saw the, the, the gospel, but it was always happening in Jerusalem. It, it was always working its, its spiritual work in Jerusalem and Judea. But you'll remember that Stephen, one of the deacons that was chosen to serve the widows, because he shared his love of Jesus with those Jewish leaders, they ended up stoning him. And of course, that got the early church a little bit worked up. Persecution had come. And so the Christians were scattered. They left Jerusalem, and they went beyond the walls of Jerusalem. And as they went, for the first time, the church finally became, at that moment, a church in mission, which is really what Jesus always wanted the church to be, a church in mission. So if Jesus' command to us is to take this gospel message to those all around who are spiritually lost, how then, how do, how do we apply what we're 
reading and studying here in Scripture. How do we apply that to us who are sitting here at Cornerstone this morning? How do we maximize the message of Jesus and his grace to those who do not have peace with God? Well, there are three takeaways from the Scripture that's before us. I'm not going to have time to get to all three today. In fact, I'm only going to really focus in on the, the first thing that seems to surface when you study this portion of Scripture. How do we maximize the gospel? How do we take the gospel out beyond these four walls? Well, the first point is this. We have to keep stagnation out of the church. Very simple point. We've got to keep stagnation out of the church. Well, what, what does that mean? What is the definition of stagnation? Well, stagnation happens when something ceases to flow. There's no doubt that over this past summer, you've probably gone out and, and uh, maybe gone up to New Hampshire or Vermont, Maine, maybe out Western Mass. You come across these beautiful rivers. And you want to play in the beautiful river. You want to play in that flowing river. But you never find anybody playing in water that's become stagnated. That's not fun. It's ugly. It's gross. It's disgusting. But really, that's what stagnation is. It's when the water ceases to flow. Stagnation happens when, when something utterly becomes stale. It, it becomes foul. It, 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 it happens because it's, because it's sitting idle. And when spiritual growth in my life ceases to continue on, I've now entered into that process of stagnation. And I've been there. And I'm sure some of you have been there. You know what that looks like. You, you know what that feels like. Spiritual stagnation in our lives leads us to very dangerous places. Because spiritual stagnation is taking us from the heart of the gospel. Spiritual stagnation is, is, is taking us a little bit by little bit by little bit, away from the truth of God's living word, and now we're starting to fall into the ways of the world. And what do the ways of the world lead us to? It leads us to imprisonment, right? We're, 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 we're like people in jail, spiritually speaking. We have no hope. We have no joy. We have no love for others. We have no peace in our hearts. That's where spiritual stagnation can take us. So, the question is very simple. How do I keep my spiritual life from stagnation? How do we as a church, like here in, in, in Jerusalem, this early church, how do we as a church stay away from spiritual stagnation? Well, we need to fulfill our mission, just as this early church did, by sharing with others the gospel of the good news. Hear me out on this. In the Christian life, there are really only two alternatives. Either I'm stretching out spiritually, or I'm stagnating inwardly. I can only be on one of those two paths as a spiritual person. I'm either stagnating or I'm stretching. I'm growing. I'm moving. My roots are moving into God's truth. Now, it says here in verse 4 of chapter 8 of this book of Acts, it says, those who were scattered because of the persecution, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, I was just sitting there this morning thinking, I wonder what would happen to a group like us if, 
in a, in a few months, somebody came in and said, listen, what you're doing is illegal, and we're not going to let you do it anymore. You need to leave this place, and you need to just turn and go a different direction and start doing something different on Sunday mornings. And that, those things that you do during the week, you gotta, there's a spiritual nature, you've got to stop doing that as well. Now, what would you do at that moment? Because it could very well happen in our lifetime. But the question is, what would you do? What would I would do? What would we do as a corporate group? When persecution came to this early church, when hard times came their way, did they get fearful? Did they get stuck in their fear? Did they become anxious and just run and say, oh, my goodness, we got to stop this. I, we can't go on like this. I can't live like this. Did they panic? Did it? Did they decide that following Jesus was too hard? The persecution wasn't worth it. Like, I need to live my life. I, I, yeah, I like church, I like Jesus, but I can live my life. And if this is the cost that it, that it carries with it, maybe, maybe I really don't want to follow Jesus. Is that how they reacted? No, it says that when they were persecuted, they scattered, but they went about proclaiming they went about announcing, they went about declaring the good news about Jesus. Do you think that they went with a fake message from their heart? Like, do you think that they went and said, you know, I love church, I, I, I love being a Christian, but, you know, I don't want to be too far out there, so... Uh, I'll go and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell all of this a little bit about what's happened in our past, but uh, I don't want to go too far. I mean, do you, do you think that it was that kind of excitement in their heart that went out with them? I, I, I don't get that when I read this portion of Scripture. You know what I get? These men and women were so in love with Jesus. Physical life didn't matter anymore. They had found the truth. And you know what the truth teaches us? The truth teaches us that we're all sinners. And that in our sin, we're separated from God. We don't have peace with God. If you don't have Jesus in your life this morning, you're at, what the scripture says, you're at enmity with God. Like, his wrath is still hanging out there over us. But the good news is that he loved us so much that he didn't want us to live in that place. And so he sent his son Jesus to do on our behalf what we could never do on ourselves. And that was to live a perfect life, die a perfect sacrifice, be our substitute on the cross so that all of our sin was paid for. That truth was a reality in their life and it moved them to the point where they were so in love with Jesus that the physical life that they were living no longer mattered. They wanted to live for Jesus. He was first in their life. And so, sometimes the longer we know Christ, the more we take for granted the reality of what he's done for us. I, I was thinking this morning as I was having my devotion, I, I, I've probably been a Christian for 55 years. So I know firsthand how easy it is to just go to church and check off the box and I've done my spiritual thing. And even as a pastor, I, I, I can go week to week and just preach a sermon and do my thing and you know, serve the church and just kind of, it just be, can become routine, it can become mechanical. I know what it's like. constantly I have to be in God's word in his truth and constantly I've got to be in communion speaking and praying and seeking Jesus so that he won't let me come to that place in my life where I become stagnated A.B. Simpson the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance once said this he said 
the Christian that is bound by his own horizon, the church that lives simply for itself, is bound to die a spiritual death and sink into stagnancy and corruption. We never can thank God enough for giving us not only a whole gospel to believe, but a whole world to give it to. See, if you're a genuine Christian, the gospel of Jesus will have done something in your life, in your heart, where you alone know that you have been set free. If the gospel has truly taken root in your life, you alone will know whether God's spirit now resides in you and that you have been set free. When that is a reality in your life, you will want to be a disperser of that good news. You want to be a dispenser of that good news. When Jesus comes alive in us, we don't just sit idle. We don't just do our thing in this world and add on God on Sundays. That's not true Christianity, okay? And, and honestly, I'm not trying to put anybody down this morning. I, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to woo you into the truth of God's word. That if you're not dispensing the good news, it's quite possible either you've never left stagnation or you're living in stagnation. And what I want you to know is that's just a dangerous place to be. We don't want anybody to be there. We don't want anybody to stay there. Now, it says in verse 5 that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he proclaimed to them Christ. So it's interesting, you know, Philip, one of the deacons that's been chosen, you'll remember him back from chapter 6. That's where we met him with Stephen. It, it, it just interests me that it doesn't say that because of the persecution and because his friend Stephen was just killed, it doesn't say that he went down to Samaria and, 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 and said to them, you wouldn't believe what just happened to us in Jerusalem. He doesn't go down there and say, you know, I had to come here because I'm so afraid for my life. Again, none of that is spoken of. What it says is, he proclaimed to them Jesus. Which says to me, Jesus was the focus of his life. Jesus was the treasure of his life. Because again, I want you to put yourselves in this situation. You've been persecuted, and so you've been dispersed out of the safety of this you know, net here, and you're out on your own almost, and spiritually speaking, you're out there by yourself. What are you going to do? What is your life going to proclaim? Fear, anger, or Jesus? It says there in verse 6, Philip goes, he proclaims Jesus, and then it says this, that the crowds there in Samaria, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip, and when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. So this group in Samaria, the, the, the crowd that is, that, that is gathered there, no doubt is people just like you and me, just doing life. We're going to see that they were kind of buying into a little bit of Simon and what Simon was all about with his magic tricks and all. But here, Philip goes, he talks about Jesus, and it says the crowds with one accord 
paid attention to what was being said, what was being proclaimed. Well, that phrase, one accord, it's interesting. It's used 11 times in the New Testament, but 10 of those 11 times it's used right here in Acts. And you see, God's Spirit was moving in a real, genuine, authentic way, and people's lives were being transformed, and spiritual hearts were were being transformed inwardly, and relationships were beginning to change outwardly. So my heart is changed, but that change doesn't just stay inside of me. It starts to move out. And it starts to get into a relationship. So, the followers of Jesus are following love, and falling in love with God's truth. And God's truth is changing attitudes and habits and self-centeredness. And God's people, called out ones, are now becoming of one accord. They're becoming a family that cares for each other. And verse 7 tells us that as Philip went about sharing the good news, it says there the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. And then it says unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lamed were healed. That's pretty wild. The question is, why don't we see that kind of power any longer? At least here in this part of the world. Well, you see, we live in the Western world church, which is pretty much anti-spiritual Christianity. Anti-supernatural Christianity. And so what's happened is we've swung the pendulum so far the other way that now we want to make everything a psychological problem rather than a spiritual problem. And so we'll talk about it and we'll help talk you through it or we'll give you something. And listen, I'm all for Christian counseling. I've been in it myself. I'm, I'm all for counseling. But when counseling trumps the truths and the principles of God's word, again, now you're going down a dangerous road. So, the other reason that we don't see often, I believe, God's supernatural power at work is we become, and listen, I'm, if there's anybody that's traditional and conservative, it's me, but what happens is I think we get afraid that if God was ever to move outside of my construct, if God moved in a way that I'm not necessarily familiar with, I think that fear would overcome us because now we're out of control. We have, we no longer have control. So like, suppose God's spirit just kind of started to fall upon us and supernatural things started happening and people just started to get healed. Like, how would you feel about that? How would I feel about that? But that's what we see happening here. Because that's the reality of Jesus and the power that he holds. And so, what we have to remember as as Christians is that our problem is really threefold. As a Christian, as a Christ follower, our problem is threefold. The world the flesh, and Satan. Those are three enemies that every follower of Jesus is going to fight his whole life. The world, Satan, and the flesh. And I think what we have to recognize is that Satan is real. He's a created being. He falls under the authority of God himself, but he is a real being. And the only power that Satan has over the life of a Christian is the power of a lie. The power of a lie. 
That's the only power that Satan has over us. He's going to whisper lies in your ear in hope that you will believe the lie, the deception over the truth of God's word. And so the only way that that lie can be broken in our lives is by the washing of the truth of God's word. And sometimes God will use supernatural ways to break the bondage of hardened hearts. Sometimes God will use supernatural means to break the power of sin in our lives and and what that sin has produced. So you'll remember in the Garden of Eden, we were perfect. We were in harmony with God. Our lives were perfect. Adam and Eve had perfect lives. But what did Satan do? He came and he deceived them. And they bought into the lie. And that lie now caused a chasm. And when sin entered into the world, everything started to break down. Creation is in a breakdown mode. Our lives are in a breakdown mode. That's why we have diseases. That's, that's why, you know, you're going to go to the dentist. That's why you're going to go, your hearing goes, your hair goes, everything goes. We're in a breakdown mode. At least some of us have that problem. And, and, and sometimes in that breakdown mode, God will do something supernatural to show that he's still in control. I remember a pastor who, something had happened and he lost his voice. And I, I can't remember if it was a disease. I, I, there was something that he had that as a pastor, uh, he just lost his voice. All he could do was whisper. And I actually have a cassette tape uh, of him preaching a sermon and he's whispering. But he's on this Sunday, preaching about the power that God has to heal. Now, it's been at least six to eight months that he's had no voice, just whispering. And on this cassette tape, all of a sudden, as he's preaching this message about healing, his voice comes back. Why? Because Jesus holds all authority over all of our lives. And that's exactly why it says in verse 8 that there was much joy in that city. They heard the truth. And, and, and the truth took root in their hearts. And the Holy Spirit began to help them to see that their sins separated them from God. But Jesus came and paid the price on the cross for their sin. And, and he became their substitute. And... and, and simply by putting their trust, simply by us putting our trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we're set free spiritually. And all of our sins, the Bible said, are forgiven. And the question is, why would that not bring joy to our hearts? So much so that when I wake up in the morning, I can't wait to be with Jesus. And when I go to bed at night, I can't wait to meditate on the goodness of Jesus in my life. You see, the, the danger of, of the church community is that, is that we can, because of all different reasons, we can just become stagnated. And we've talked about this before. Every, every gathering, every group, every club at some point, becomes lethargic. It, it loses its mission. Remember a number of years ago, I, I, I showed you the, the lighthouse, the, the video of the lighthouse, and how that lighthouse was put in place to save people who were traveling on the ocean. And so people would join the, the whatever it was, club there, and, and they would take turns going up, turning on the light, being there so that Ships would be safe. And then the next thing they know, we're over a couple of years, hey, let's get together at the Lighthouse Club. Let's have a drink and uh, let's talk. And all the while, the boats are out in the ocean. 
crashing. Why? Because they had lost their mission. They became stagnated. They, no longer with, they were no longer living the mission that they originally had come together for. And so Jesus is reminding us here this morning, listen, the mission, the reason I've saved you is so that you can go out and be proclaimers, declarers, announcers, heralders of this good news so that people who do not have peace with God that are in your network, in your family, in your, at your workplace, they can hear the good news. And if the good news is not coming from your mouth, you are living in a stagnated place in your life. Because Jesus, Jesus doesn't live in us so that we can be idle. Jesus lives in us so that we can be his messengers. And I say that to myself this morning as much as I say it to you. Don't use the excuse, I don't share Jesus because I don't have the gift of evangelism. That's a bunch of baloney. We don't share Jesus because Jesus isn't the treasure of our lives. If Jesus was the treasure of our lives and he was our whole life, we would be adamant about getting the message out to as many people as possible. The joy, the peace, hear me, the purpose that God has for your life, you're not going to find that anywhere else except in the truth of God's word. And as you soak yourself in that truth, your spiritual roots, the roots of your heart are going to begin to grow and deepen. And your love is going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger for him and for others. Remember what it said in Revelation when we worked through the seven churches in Revelation? One of the churches that was disciplined by Jesus himself said this, very simply, you've lost your first love. You've gone to other things. It's time to come back. And quite honestly, that's, that's why we celebrate communion together. It, it, it's an opportunity for us to, to recognize fresh and anew this morning the cost, hear me, the cost that Jesus paid for your life. He suffered and died in our place so that we could be set free. And it's only his blood that can cleanse our sins. And so if you find yourself in a place of stagnation in, in, in your journey with Jesus this morning, I, I just lovingly, humbly want to say to you, take, let's take a few moments before we partake of the elements together and let's just ask Jesus to become fresh and new in our lives again this morning. We can't just manufacture that. We can't just make it happen. It has to be the movement of his spirit in our hearts. But Jesus, it says in his word that, that Jesus pursues us with goodness and mercy. And so you're not beyond his hands this morning. Nobody's beyond his hands. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you're at in your walk with the Lord this morning. It can be fresh and new starting right now. But it starts by seeking Jesus and asking him to speak to you right where you're at today. So I'm going to ask Sue if she would come and just play a little bit of background music. Let's just take a few moments can be a little bit uncomfortable let's just take a minute a minute of quietness and you just do business with God on your own and if it's time for you to make a u-turn and come back to him you ask him to start working in a new way in you this morning